Welcome to Aviation World. When the pedestal is reached during the pre-flight, verify that the thrust levers are in the idle position with the reverser lever stowed, engine master switches are off, engine one and engine two fire and fault lights are extinguished, and engine mode selector is in the norm position. It is now time to start engines. We will start the engines using the automatic engine start procedure. One of the three sources of air could be used to start the engines. APU bleed air, opposite engine bleed air, external high pressure air. Today we will use the APU bleed air, which has already been selected on. We can see this on the EWD and on the APU bleed push button. During the start sequence, many of the engine parameters are monitored, controlled, and protected by the FADEX. In order to start the engines, the engine mode selector must be moved to the ignition start position. Advance to move the engine mode selector to the ignition start position. When ignition start is selected, the FADEX are powered again. This is shown on the EWD by the indications changing from amber to green, except for N1 and N2. N1 and N2 will be displayed after they reach a predetermined rotation speed. The engine page replaces the door oxy page and displays all the engine indications. After 30 seconds, without any movement from the engine master switches, the door oxy page would replace the engine page automatically until the engine master switch is selected on. We will start the engines using the available APU bleed air to operate the pneumatic starters. We can see that the APU is providing 32 psi of bleed pressure at the engine start valves. The normal procedure is to start engine 2 first because of the yellow hydraulic system engine driven pump is on engine 2 and the yellow system supplies parking brake pressure. Advance to move engine 2 master switch to the on position. The corresponding start valve opens. This is indicated by the start valve indication changing from cross line to in line. During the start sequence, start valve open. If bleed air pressure drops below the normal range and N2 is 10% or more, the bleed air pressure indication changes to amber. We will now look at the engine indications during the start process. The fuel used is reset to zero. On the EWD, N2 increases. It is displayed on a gray background indicating that the FADEC is involved in the start process. On the engine page, the oil pressure increases. Approximately 30 seconds after the master switch is selected on, an igniter is powered and fuel flow increases. The active igniter is indicated by a letter A or B on the engine page. In this example, the FADEC is using igniter B. The active igniter alternates on successive starts. When light off occurs, EGT increases. As N2 increases, N1 begins to increase. When N2 is between 43 and 48 percent, the FADEC closes the start valve and deactivates the igniter. Notice on the engine page, the start valve is closed and the igniter indication is removed. The thrust limit mode changes from climb to toga, and today the EPA rating limit for toga is 1.456. The rating would change to flex at this point if a flex temperature was entered in the McDo. At approximately 58% N2, N2 stabilizes and the gray background is removed, indicating that FADEC has finished the start sequence. Engine 2 is now running and all parameters have stabilized. Now let's start engine 1. Advance to select engine 1 master switch on. Advance to observe each step of the engine start process. At approximately 58% N2, 
and 2 stabilizes and the gray background is removed, indicating that the engine 1 start sequence is complete. The last action is to move the engine mode selector to the norm position. Advance to move engine mode selector to the norm position. When the engine mode selector is moved back to the norm position, the wheel page will eventually replace the engine page. This can take up to 10 seconds. If the engine mode selector is not moved to the norm position, the engine page will remain displayed and override the automatic ECAM page display logic. That concludes the automatic engine start sequence. We will now look at another normal operation, a manual engine start. There are several reasons why a manual start may be required. They are listed in the beginning of the manual engine start procedure in your manuals. The main purpose of a manual start is to allow the engine to reach its max motoring speed prior to ignition and fuel flow. The main purpose of a manual engine start is to allow the engine to reach its max motoring speed prior to ignition and fuel flow. During the manual start procedure, the man start push button is used to allow the engine RPM to increase and stabilize at its max motoring speed, a minimum of 15% N2, before selecting engine master switch on. Selecting an engine master switch on activates both igniters, A and B, and simultaneously initiates fuel flow to the engine. The manual engine start procedure is in your manuals and is not a memory item. Unlike an automatic engine start, during a manual start, FADIC only provides passive monitoring of start faults. FADIC does not have start abort authority during a manual start. It is the responsibility of the crew to prevent the engine from exceeding limits. We will assume a normal automatic start has already been attempted but failed due to low bleed pressure. The decision has been made to attempt a manual start. Before attempting a second start of the same engine, the engine mode selector should be recycled to the norm position, then back to ignition start. This resets the FADEC and prepares it for another start attempt. Advance to move the engine mode selector back to the norm position. Now that the FADEC has been reset, let's move it back to ignition start. The engine mode selector is now in the ignition start position. The FADEX are energized and the engine parameters are displayed on the EWD. The engine panel is displayed automatically. We will start engine 2 using APU bleed. Other bleed sources could be used as the situation requires. The engine manual start push buttons are used to open the respective start valve. Advance to lift the guard and push the engine 2 manual start push button. The engine 2 start valve opened. The engine has reached its maximum motoring speed and FADEC is monitoring the start process. Now that the engine has reached a maximum motoring speed, 15% minimum, you can select engine 2 master switch on. Advance to select engine 2 master switch on. Selecting the master switch on resets fuel used to zero, activates both igniters, A and B, and initiates fuel flow. Notice also that N1 has started to increase. The FADEC automatically uses both igniters, A and B, for a manual start. Observe these indications, then advance to continue with the manual start process. When N2 is between 43 and 48%, FADEC automatically closes the start valve and deactivates both igniters. Advance to select Engine 2 Manual Start Push Button Off. Selecting the manual start push button off simply makes the push button agree with the automatic closure of the start valve by the FADEC. N2 continues to increase. At about 58%, N2 stabilizes and the gray background is removed. Engine 2 is now running and all parameters are stabilized. You would then proceed to start engine 1, but we will move on taxiing the aircraft. Only a small increase in thrust is typically needed to get the aircraft moving on the ground. Once it is moving, idle thrust is usually sufficient to maintain taxi speed. On the ground, thrust control is entirely conventional. 
Thrust output corresponds directly to thrust lever position. During taxi out, the EWD should be checked to ensure the correct thrust mode is displayed, toga or flex. Today we will be making a flex takeoff with a pilot entered flex temperature of 35 degrees centigrade. This means that with the thrust levers in the flex detent, the engines will provide the thrust equivalent to that produced using toga with a 35 degree centigrade ambient air temperature. Flex takeoffs significantly extend engine life, uses less fuel, and should be considered the normal takeoff power setting. Flex takeoffs will be discussed in more detail during later training. When on the ground at low speed, the FADEC protects against fan flutter by preventing the engine from being stabilized in a range of 60 to 74 percent N1. Therefore, during engine acceleration on the ground, you may notice a nonlinear thrust response to thrust lever movement. Today, we will make a flex takeoff since this is what you will do on the majority of your takeoffs. The first step is to move the thrust levers from idle to approximately 1.1 EPER. Keep in mind that thrust lever position is indicated by the blue circles on the outside of the EPER gauges. Advance to move the thrust levers to 1.1 EPER. Pausing the thrust levers at 1.1 EPER during the takeoff provides you with an opportunity to ensure that the engines are producing thrust symmetrically and that everything is normal. As both EPER needles approach 1.1 EPER, the thrust levers may be moved to the desired takeoff thrust setting, in this case, flex. It is not necessary to hold the brakes while the engines accelerate to 1.1 EPER or to wait until the thrust actually achieves 1.1 EPER before moving the thrust levers to takeoff position. Advance to move the thrust levers to the flex detent. When takeoff thrust is applied, the engine page replaces the wheel page on the SD. Moving the thrust levers to a takeoff position, either flex or toga, on the ground automatically arms the auto thrust. During takeoff roll, the EPER gauges should be checked to ensure that both engines have achieved the EPER displayed in the upper right hand corner of the EWD. Toga thrust is always available by moving the thrust levers to the toga position. At a thrust reduction altitude, normally 1500 feet AGL, we will move the thrust levers aft to the climb detent. Advance to move the thrust levers to the climb detent. When the levers are in the climb detent, auto thrust automatically changes from armed to active. The thrust limit mode changes to climb with the corresponding change in EPER rating limit. After a short delay, the cruise page replaces the engine page on the SD. We are now in cruise flight. The thrust levers are in the climb detent and the auto thrust is active. To maintain the desired speed in level flight, the auto thrust system is commanding an EPER of 1.210. Assume you have just begun a long descent to a lower altitude. With inputs from the FMS, the auto thrust has determined that idle thrust is required for the descent. Advance now to see EPER move to idle. Let's look at this in more detail. When auto thrust is active, green arcs are displayed between the actual EPER and the auto thrust commanded EPER value. The green triangle indicates the direction of EPER tendency. When the new EPER value is reached, all of these indications except for the actual EPER disappear. These indications are only displayed when auto thrust is active. Auto thrust and the associated indications are covered in more detail later in training. During cruise, descent, and approach phases, auto thrust is normally active and the thrust levers remain in the climb detent. In heavy rain, turbulence, or in other situations, it may be advisable to manually activate continuous ignition. Refer to your aircraft manuals for more details. 
Moving the engine mode selector to the ignition start position when the engines are running activates both igniters in each engine. Advance to move the engine mode selector to the ignition start position. The ignition memo is displayed on the EWD when the continuous ignition is activated. We are now ready to land. During landing, the pilot will move the thrust levers to idle. There is a retard auto callout to remind the crew if this has not been done. Advance to move the thrust levers to idle. Moving the thrust levers to idle disengages the auto thrust and returns the thrust to manual operation. Select reverse thrust after main gear touchdown. Advance to select reverse thrust. Reverse is displayed in amber when the reversers are unstowed. Reverse is displayed in green when the reversers are fully deployed. Notice that the thrust limit mode on the EWD now displays max reverse. Except on slippery runways, if one reverser fails to deploy properly, the good reverser can still be used. Advance to select full reverse thrust. Both engines are now producing the max reverse thrust setting of 1.180 EPER. The max reverse thrust is available down to 70 knots. No later than 70 knots, you should move the thrust levers to reverse idle, then to the idle stop. Advance to move the thrust levers to the reverse idle position. The thrust levers are now in the reverse idle detent. Advance to move the thrust levers to the forward idle stop. The thrust levers are now at the idle stop and the reversers are stowed. We are now at the gate, it's time to shut down the engines. To do that, the corresponding engine master switches must be selected off. If unable to shut down an engine using the engine master switch, the engine could, in usual circumstances, be shut down using the respective engine fire push button on the overhead which closes the low pressure fuel valve. If an engine fire push button is used to shut down an engine, there is a delay of approximately 40 seconds before the engine shuts down. This is because it takes time to burn the fuel remaining between the low pressure fuel valve and the engine. Let's take a look at some abnormal operations. In this section, we will cover the indications of specific failures and detail their consequences. As you perform these steps required to deal with these selected failures, you will gain a better understanding of the system. We will begin with a demonstration of an abnormal engine start. We are at the gate with all the flows and checklists complete up to the engine start. Advance to rotate engine mode selector to ignition start. Continue the procedure by selecting engine 2 master switch on. Initially, you will see all the indications you have observed before, including fuel used reset to zero, the start valve opens, and to increases, oil pressure increases. Within 30 seconds, an igniter is displayed, in this case igniter B, and fuel flow begins. You hear a single chime and the master caution light illuminates. We have extinguished the master caution for you. On the engine panel, the engine 2 fault light illuminates, indicating that the automatic start has been aborted. The ECAM message confirms this. The new start in progress message is not an action step. It indicates that the FADIC has detected a problem during an automatic start and is taking steps to attempt to correct the problem and accomplish a successful start. The FADIC will abort an automatic start on the ground for many reasons. It is not necessary for you to memorize them, but it is important that you understand the FADIC is watching for numerous abnormalities during start including start time exceeded, impending EGT over temp, no light off, lower than normal N1, start failure, or hung start. The ECAM will display the same start fault message if any of these start problems occur. Watch what FADIC does to attempt to get the engine started. Automatically, the FADIC shuts off the fuel and turns off the ignition. 
After 30 seconds of dry crank, a new start is launched. Advance to observe the next start attempt. Both igniters A and B are now activated and the fuel flow begins. If the FADIC is successful in getting the engine started, the ECAM message will be removed and the fault light will extinguish. If the second start attempt is unsuccessful or if FADIC makes no further attempts to start the engine, the ECAM will reflect that the start was aborted. Notice that the igniters have been deactivated and the start valve has closed. On the ECAM, a secondary message is displayed indicating that the start fault is due to no light up. An action step is now displayed directing you to select the engine master off. The display of this action step confirms that FADIC has given up trying to start the engine. Advance to select engine 2 master switch off. At this point, you would seek assistance for maintenance. Now let's look at another abnormal. Here we have a loss of EPR mode in flight. If the EPR mode is lost, the affected FADIC automatically reverts to N1 mode. During cruise, you hear a single chime and the master caution lights illuminate. We have extinguished the master caution light for you. The first message relates to the loss of auto thrust. Auto thrust is lost if EPR mode is lost on either engine. If auto thrust fails for any reason, thrust is locked at the current setting. The thrust will remain locked at the current setting until a thrust lever is moved or auto thrust is restored. When you accomplish the action step and move the thrust levers out of the climb detent, you transition to manual thrust operation. Before we take that step, let's look at how other indications on the EWD have changed. The engine one EPR gauge is amber. The EPR needle is removed and the digital readout is replaced by amber X's. All of these indications show that engine one EPR mode is lost. Changes have also occurred on the engine one N1 gauge. The blue circle representing thrust lever position is now displayed on the N1 gauge. A gray box now surrounds the digital N1 indication. An amber tick now appears on the N1 gauge indicating N1 toga limit. The amber tick mark will move to indicate the max reverse N1 limit when reverse thrust is used. Reverser status is still indicated on the EPR gauges. We have moved the thrust levers and are controlling thrust manually. We are now ready to perform the next ECAM action items. Advance to push the engine 1 and 1 mode push button. The on light in the N1 mode push button is now illuminated. Advance to push engine 2 N1 mode push button. The engine 2 EPR gauge turns amber indicating that the EPR mode is lost. The N1 indications are now the same for both engines. Once both engines are operating in N1 mode, the EPR limit mode is replaced by the N1 limit mode and the current N1 limit. It indicates that both engines are now controlling using N1. Display of the N1 limit mode and the current limit indicates that the engines are operating in rated N1 mode. As the remaining blue action steps indicates, it is now necessary to control thrust manually for the rest of the flight. What you have just seen is an example of a loss of EPR mode that results in using rated N1 mode. Depending on the nature of the malfunction that caused the loss of EPR mode, the system may revert to unrated N1 mode shown here. Notice that the max N1 tick mark is not displayed on the N1 gauge. In unrated N1 mode, the N1 limit mode and the current limit are replaced by amber X's. FADIC overspeed protections are reduced in the unrated N1 mode of operation. It is possible to exceed certain engine limitations in unrated N1 mode. Let's briefly look at some other abnormal engine indications you might see. Here we have a clog in the engine 1 oil filter. Notice that there are no action items to perform. On the engine page, which is displayed automatically, an oil filter clog indication is displayed. You would clear the ECAM and refer to your aircraft manuals. The same type of problem can occur with the engine fuel system. Here we have an engine 2 fuel filter clog. 
Again, you would clear the ECAM and refer to your aircraft manuals. Low oil pressure has been detected in engine 1. The CRC sounds and the master warning lights flash. We have canceled them for you. The associated message and the checklist are displayed on the EWD. The engine page is displayed automatically. Notice that the engine 1 oil pressure is displayed in red, indicating the oil pressure is too low. The procedure is to verify low oil pressure by checking the engine page and then shut down the engine. Next, we will demonstrate an engine EGT over limit in cruise. Engine 2 EGT has increased above the normal range. Notice the amber EGT indications. The EGT has continued to increase and the EGT indication is now red. The only ECAM action is to move the thrust lever until the EGT is within limits. Advance to reduce the engine 2 thrust lever. The EGT has now decreased and indication has changed from red to green. The highest EGT achieved is indicated by a red tick mark on the gauge. That concludes the abnormal operation section. Let's take a look at some of the A321 engine differences. Remember that both the A319 and A321 are equipped with IAE V2500 series engines. The A321 engine is simply a D-rated version. The A319s are equipped with V2524-A5 engines capable of producing up to 24,000 pounds of thrust. The A321s are equipped with V2533-A5 engines capable of producing up to 32,500 pounds of thrust. You will also notice differences in EGT limits on an A319 versus an A321. Refer to your aircraft manuals for this information. You will also notice some of the differences on aircraft equipped with LCD style displays versus CRT style displays. The information displayed is nearly identical, but the locations and appearance are slightly different. You might also notice that the thrust lever position is a blue donut on the LCD style displays and white on the CRT style.